Polished art historian Giorgio Vasari gave the art of the Byzantine East a lousy press. It was crude, unsophisticated, primitive. And I sometimes wonder, although he wrote 500 years ago, I wonder if we haven't taken him too much at his word. I don't think I've ever seen a television programme about the art of Byzantium. Certainly, the subject is abbreviated to a few simplifications in most histories of world art. And yet, the art that was produced in the East was amongst the most vibrant, colourful and energetic that the world's ever seen. I want to explore that tradition, to tell its story. And it's a story that begins here, in a city called Istanbul, that was once called Constantinople. This modern, chaotic port city was once the very centre of a dynasty so powerful that it seemed immune to change and decay. But nothing lasts forever. And the story of how a once great Christian empire grew and spread from this place, how it reached its zenith, how it faded and died, all that is reflected in the radiant, shape-shifting forms of its art. It was Emperor Constantine, the earliest Christian Roman emperor, who first came here in 324 AD, when this place was known as Byzantium. Strategically situated on the banks of the Bosphorus, the city straddles Europe and Asia. Emperor Constantine changed its name to Constantinople. In this mosaic of the 6th century, he's seen offering the new capital to God, and, by the same token, seeking God's protection for his new empire in the East. The thousand-year period that followed would become known as the Byzantine era, with Constantinople its most important centre for political and cultural thought. As well as establishing a whole new Roman headquarters, Constantine brought with him the new religion known as Christianity. The marriage between Christianity and the people of the Byzantine world would create some outstanding works of art and architecture. Buildings and images designed to convince those who experienced them that the Christian faith was indeed the one true path to salvation. It's an irony of fate and history that many great churches, such as the Hagia Sophia, were later transformed into mosques but their origins are very definitely Christian. There's no greater monument to the might and the splendour of the once glorious Byzantine civilization than this great cathedral, the Hagia Sophia. Walking in is a sense-stunning experience, this great dome raised up above you into the vault of heaven almost as extraordinary as the sheer physical presence of the place is the fact that it was all built in just five years. In the past, this place was the most prestigious building of the Byzantine Empire and the centre of what came to be known as Orthodox Christianity. This building dates from the early 6th century and is a testament to one of the most important figures of the Byzantine Empire, Emperor Justinian I. His rule coincided with what might be described as the Golden Age of Byzantium, a time of unparalleled peace and prosperity that made possible the very creation of the Hagia Sophia. The original scheme was very simple on the evidence of what survived, basic crosses, and almost nothing figurative. Whether this was a planned effect of sobriety and restraint, or merely a way of getting the building finished on time, we'll never know. What is certain is that the building of the Hagia Sophia changed the course of world architecture. Its massive dome, seemingly suspended in mid-air, appears to defy gravity, having no obvious means of support. The dome of this building is uh, 32 metres across. Uh, we do, of course, have the 
dome of the Pantheon in, in Rome, uh, which is larger, but uh, this is a much more daring architectural construction. Well, I, can, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about what someone from Rome would have thought coming to this place. They would have had the Pantheon in their mind. But what's, what I assume would have struck them would have been that, yes, you've got a dome as big as the Pantheon's dome, but it's been sort of vertically propelled. <laughs> and, and it's surrounded by this other huge architectural fabric. Absolutely, uh, and uh, if, if you think about the Pantheon in particular, the dome is supported on a continuous wall, it's on a, on a drum. Here we've got something quite different. When you go into the church, it's very difficult to see just how the dome is supported because uh, everything is veiled behind colonnades, so the, the main piers really don't stand out when you're looking at the interior of the building. Do, do you think it, I mean, I think that's a very interesting point. Do you think it might have struck your ordinary... Byzantine bloke as a kind of feat of divine, miraculous engineering, you know, visible, tangible evidence that this guy must have God on his side. Oh. Otherwise, how could he float something like that? I'm sure, yes, I'm sure. In Byzantine imperial philosophy, the, the emperor was God's representative on earth. By building a cathedral like this on such a massive scale, Justinian was making the point that his power was uh, supported by God. The Church of the Hagia Sophia is an architectural marvel that became the great church of the Byzantine Empire, which at the time of Emperor Justinian I stretched from modern-day Turkey in the east to Spain in the west. The work created in Constantinople was the alpha and omega of Byzantine art. But tragically, many of its very earliest masterpieces have been lost. For centuries, the traditions forged in Constantinople shaped European art. And you can see the extent of its impact in the satellite cities of the empire. <laughs> One of the key Byzantine centres was Thessaloniki in modern-day northern Greece. Nestling beside the sea in a natural harbour, it was a crucial outpost of the empire. A thriving port today, as it was in the 5th and 6th centuries, its prosperity was built on maritime trade. Such was its strategic importance that Emperor Constantine almost chose it as his first city over Constantinople. He was probably right not to, as this was a city under constant threat of invasion. But it's the fact that it was under almost permanent siege that lends the art that developed here its particularly intense quality. This part of town is built up now, a honeycomb of streets and houses, but 1,500 years ago these were fields perched above the city. And standing alone at the summit of the hill, was a monastery dedicated to St. David. Inside is the Church of Osias David, which contains a stunning 6th century mosaic in near pristine condition, a fascinating glimpse of the forces shaping Christian art in the early Byzantine world. It's a work of art that shows us very clearly how strong the Greco-Roman tradition, the Hellenistic tradition of culture and art was in this city, because it doesn't really look like a Byzantine mosaic, if one thinks of Byzantine mosaics as having lots of gold and glitter, the colours are very low, this muted, beautiful muted blues and reds and greens, and the modelling of the figures is very sculptural. And if you look at that central figure of Christ, you can really sense the way in which the artist is taking the powers of the old gods, the pagan gods, and giving them to the new Christian god. The subject's taken from the book of Revelations. It's the vision of Ezekiel. And you can see Ezekiel on the left-hand side, this urgent, crouching figure with his hand to his ear, experiencing this great vision of Christ. And we see Christ surrounded by the attributes of his evangelists. There's Mark the lion, Matthew the angel, John the eagle, and Luke the ox. 
it was actually quite a new subject for an artist to be taking on in the Byzantine Empire in the 6th century because the book of Revelations had only relatively recently been accepted into the canon of Christian texts. But the message of the image was unambiguous. The end of the world is nigh. Pray and repent. Get your spiritual house in order or you won't be saved. Now this image acquired even more potency later in the city's history because by the 9th century this monastery was in a relative state of disrepair and the image itself had long been covered over and forgotten about. Now the story goes that an old monk was in here one day sheltering from a storm when suddenly an earthquake struck. There was a shattering noise behind him. All the covering fell away and this image suddenly appeared. The monk was so devastated that he actually died on the spot. As a result of this act of divine intervention, this place became a site of pilgrimage. Thousands would come here to look at this image, which they believed had actually been created by God himself, in the belief that they might almost touch divinity by looking at it. The character who came to dominate the imagination of Thessalonians in the Byzantine era, perhaps even more than Christ himself, was their patron saint, the spiritual protector Saint Demetrius, as can be seen in the church dedicated to him. The church dates back to the 5th century, and although it was extensively renovated following a fire in 1917, some of the 6th and 7th century mosaics that can still be seen here are among the best surviving examples of early Byzantine art. What's most interesting about them is the emphasis they place on Demetrius himself, a warrior saint whose life and legends are enshrouded in myth, but who came to seem as present and actual as a real father or brother to the people who lived here. In Byzantine culture, the emperor himself was so closely associated with Jesus that the people at large felt they didn't have the right to approach Christ directly. Their emperor was the only mortal with a direct hotline to God, so they had to approach a figure rather lower down the divine hierarchy. And in Thessaloniki, that was Saint Demetrios. They'd pray to him in the hope that he'd pass the message upstairs and their wishes would be granted. A pattern of belief touchingly reflected in this image of him sheltering the children of the city. These mosaics show the devotion of Byzantine communities to their chosen saints. And because Thessaloniki was so regularly besieged, this was a city that needed a never-ending supply of miracles. Reading through the annals of the city, it seems that St. Demetrius was forever saving the people of Thessaloniki from one disaster or another. In times of plague, they'd pray to him and be miraculously cured. Or if the city was being invaded, he'd come to their aid. On one occasion, the Slavs attacked by night, and suddenly his church burst into flames, waking up all the people. They put out the fire, realised they were being attacked, and repelled the invaders. Once again, St. Demetrius had come to their aid. But my favourite story concerns a particularly mischievous deacon called Onesiphoros, who was in the habit of sneaking into the sacristy at night and stealing the candles. Candles were worth a lot of money in those days. Then, one night, while he was about this dastardly deed, the voice of St. Demetrius boomed out, Onesiphorus, you're at it again! The moral of the story being, as ever, that St. Demetrius has his eye on you at all times. And this is where St. Demetrius lies. Local people come each day to worship in the shrine that's said to contain his body and to ask for their prayers to be answered. Thessalonians still look to St. Demetrius for their help, protection and spiritual well-being. Even 
today, a high percentage of boys born in the city are christened Demetrius. Thessaloniki's geographical position made it vulnerable to attacks by land or sea. But another of the Byzantine Empire's great centres proved to be a more robust stronghold. However, even here, the tensions of the time are subtly reflected in the character of its art. For 200 years, the Italian town of Ravenna was the capital of the western half of the Byzantine Empire. From the year 479, one of the Germanic tribes, the Ostrogoths, controlled the town until Justinian I recaptured it for the empire in 540. In Ravenna's great monuments, we can sense the pendulum swings of Byzantine art as a whole, an art born out of struggle and suffering but also capable of unparalleled magnificence. San Apollinare Nuovo is famous for its great frieze of mosaic imagery, a grand procession of Christian martyrs bearing palms they seem to step in slow march around the walls of the church. The procession culminates on the northern side of the church with this wonderfully vivid representation of the three magi, the wise men from the east, fantastically dressed and offering their gifts to the infant Christ, just as the martyrs who accompany them have offered to God the gift of their lives. For all the splendour of the decoration, you can feel that what lies behind it is a very strong sense of the human cost of defending and sustaining Christianity. A faith, it's implied here, steeped in the blood of its martyrs, encircled by enemies on all sides. I love the stark simplicity of this basilica church. It's almost just a light box for the shimmering message of the mosaics. San Apollinare Nuovo is one of no fewer than eight World Heritage Sites in Ravenna. Most magnificent of all is the Church of San Vitale its greatest treasure being the cycle of mosaics in the apse of its church. Here we'll see not a Christian art of supplication as at Thessaloniki, nor a Christian art of martyrdom as at San Apollinare, Instead, we'll see a resoundingly confident assertion of imperial might, confident that God is on its side. It's a great mosaic decoration which shows us Justinian himself surrounded by his retinue and opposite him his empress with her ladies of the court. Above them, Christ is seated on a great globe. Now, all this was created nearly 1,500 years ago by a team of artists from the East, and it took them 20 years to complete. For my money, it represents the absolute high watermark of Christian art in the early Byzantine period. But to really appreciate how extraordinary it is, you need to get up close and personal.
You enter the space through an arch containing the image of Christ and his disciples. And here in the presbytery, we have a series of biblical scenes that establish the two themes of this great chapel, which are the theme of making an offering and the theme of receiving divine wisdom from God himself. Here we have Abel and Melchizedek making a sacrifice on the other side. It's the story of Abraham and Isaac. Both stories which involve making an offering, which after all, this whole church is. That's what it does. It, it makes an offering to God. Now, you have to imagine a kind of invisible membrane separating the presbytery from the apse. Because suddenly, if you move from those scenes to these scenes which contain the kingdom of heaven, paradise itself, with depictions of the empress here and the emperor here, you are actually moving, I'm stepping literally, from the realm of the world, of the mundane, of the finite, into a space that represents the infinite. And all the materials in this part of the mosaic decoration are suddenly different. Much more gold, mother of pearl, silver, these extraordinary representations of the emperor seen with his great general Belisarius who would reconquer the empire under his command and he's facing the Empress Theodora. What's fascinating about her is that she has sewn into her cloak an image of the three magi, the three wise men processing towards Christ and I think what that's expressing is the idea that these courtiers, the elite of the Byzantine world, they are another set of magi processing towards God. They are in direct touch with divinity. That's why they are allowed to have their representations in this space. Quite apart from anything else, these two panels on either side are really the only surviving portraits, and they are portraits, that we have of the Byzantine imperial court in the time of Justinian. What's wonderful about this is, is in part, the sheer actuality of it. It's a, it's a Byzantine 6th century fashion parade. They're absolutely dressed up to the nines. They, they've, they've got the Byzantine equivalent of bling in the form of bracelets that look almost like gold Rolex watches. And yet there's also a tremendous solemnity because these are images of the emperor and the empress transfigured. What these images predict is their future. They will be absorbed into paradise, into the kingdom of heaven. They will sit in majesty with the greatest emperor of them all, Christ. In these extraordinary colors, these colors like fire, we have a great offering, a great kind of fire of color and images perpetually burning to the glory of God. And it's a fire that's been lit by the emperor and the empress. And it continues burning to this day bringing good fortune onto the people of Ravenna and, by extension, the people of the whole Eastern Empire. I met an art historian who spent her life studying these mosaics, but who still can't fully explain their magic. Io spesso entro di prima mattina perché lavoro qui vicino e mi fermo e li guardo e c'è come un interrogarsi, si sente come un bisbigliare, un parlare come la sensazione che durante la notte loro hanno dialogato fra di loro che sono viventi in qualche modo ma non solo eh, eh, Giustiniano, Teodora ma lo stesso Cristo, gli arcangeli che gli sono ai lati hanno degli sguardi veramente incredibili e sembra che ci siano e, e io ho la sensazione quasi che qualcosa della loro energia è rimasta fissata in quell'oro e in quei vetri perché io non ho mai visto dei mosaici, mosaici, mosaici. mosaici che, che hanno questo, questa capacità di, di, di realizzare dei personaggi. Come hanno fatto questa magia? Come hanno fatto? Faccio un esempio banalissimo che dal basso forse non si nota. C'è il leone di San Marco che è un leone bellissimo, sicuramente a Walt Disney sarebbe piaciuto un sacco. E quell'aria un po' cattivella, un po' così vivacetta gli viene data dal fatto che all'interno dell'occhio ha uh, due tesserine di vetro arancio, questo vetro che noi chiamiamo color cadmio, che senza quelle non avrebbe quella vivacità.
The centuries after Justinian and Theodora's golden age were marked by war and internal strife. In 751, Ravenna was seized by Lombard invaders from northern Italy. This coincided with a huge theological split over the production of religious images, known in the church as the iconoclast controversy. Those who believed that it was right to depict God, Jesus and the saints clashed with those who considered it heresy. These iconoclasts considered the second commandment, thou shalt not bow down and worship any graven image, to be sacrosanct. The struggle was violent and destructive. All over the empire, precious works of art were obliterated. The controversy lasted for 120 years until it was finally resolved in 843, when the empire authorized the use and production of icons once and for all. The decision to allow religious art is commemorated in a special service in the Orthodox Church on the first Sunday in Lent. Having won the battle, the supporters of icons in the Christian East embraced art. Icons were placed at the very center of Orthodox Christian worship. And everywhere, churches decked themselves with ever more conspicuous displays of religious imagery. The victory of the icons allowed painting and mosaic to flourish once again, often at the most remote edges of the empire. Some of the best surviving examples of this new wave of Byzantine art can be found in the monasteries of Greece. Monastic life was an important aspect of the Byzantine world. The monks enjoyed the patronage of wealthy Christians and used the money to create rich works of art dedicated to the glory of God. Clinging to the steep slopes of Mount Helicon in the southwestern corner of Greece is the ancient monastery of Hosias Lucas, one of the most important Byzantine monuments built in the years after the defeat of the iconoclasts. In the Byzantine scheme of things, while the emperor was Christ's representative on earth, the monks were every bit as important because they lived the life of Christ on earth. And it was their job, through their prayers, their acts and their works, to create a kind of spiritual ladder by which all might ascend to salvation. And if you want to see what that could mean in practice, this is the place to come. The Church of Hosias Lucas is a compression chamber of spiritual aspiration. It's a grand space, but the eye is always drawn upwards to a multitude of scenes created in the glittering tessery of the mosaic maker's art. I think what's really striking about the style of these mosaics is their austerity and solemnity but what's also fascinating about the, f the faces of these prophets and saints and angels is that all the figures have these wide staring eyes as if they are literally more open than the rest of us to the light of God to me it suggests the idea almost of ecstasy that state of spiritual contemplation where you literally feel as if you are outside your body The names of those who created these 10th and 11th century images are lost in the past. Sadly, because there are lots of brilliantly fresh touches of invention here. Look at the way Christ's baptism has been depicted, how the water's been rendered as a series of circular rivulets that ripple and coil around the body of Christ. For the thousand years following their creation, the mosaics of Hosias Lucas have been cared for and revered by generation after generation of monks. <laughs>
η καθημερινή προσέγγιση στο χώρο αυτό είναι ένα προνόμιο αλλά είναι και μια ευθύνη εγώ προσωπικά θαυμάζω και δεν χορτέρω να θαυμάζω και να χαίρομαι την παρουσία των Αγίων στις ψηφιδωτές εικόνες και πιστέψτε με ότι ιδιαίτερα στη Θεία Λειτουργία και στις ακολουθίες και ιδιαίτερα το βράδυ με το λιγοστό φως ζωντανεύουν και έρχονται κοντά μας αλλά είναι και κάτι άλλο ότι θυμάμαι ότι καθώς ατενίζω εγώ τα ψηφιδωτά που σώζονται τόσο όμορφα και τόσο ζωντανά πόσε γενιές μοναχών και πιστών τα είδαν, τα θαύμασαν, τα εχάρηκαν, προσευχήθηκαν Απέκτησαν αυτή τη ζωντανή επικοινωνία με τους Αγίους, με τον Όσιο Λουκά και βέβαια αυτοί μας οδήγησαν μαζί με την Παναγία Μητέρα Του στο Χριστό. Yet in the West there's been a deep-seated prejudice, even contempt for this art, starting with Giorgio Vasari, but by no means stopping with him. The French Enlightenment writer Voltaire summed up the whole history of Byzantine civilization in two sentences. This worthless history is full of nothing but declamations and miracles. It is a disgrace to the human mind. But if he could have come here, he might just have changed his mind. This monastery is on top of a mountain, and when we look at these fantastic mosaics, we really are seeing the summit of the Byzantine art of mosaic, I think. They're absolutely wonderful. I mean, the figures are created in this very austere style, austere, severe, geometrical, reticent, and yet they're full of these sort of flashes of passion and engagement with the emotional reality of the story. There's Christ washing the feet of his disciples, and in the figures of those disciples, which are wonderfully actual and vivid, they have the same faces that you might see of people walking down the street in Athens today. You can see the mixture of humility and almost shame that he should be doing this for them. I think this crucifixion scene is also extremely impressive and very moving, despite the very severe, upright, geometrical character of the figures. It seems to me to be almost more moving than much later crucifixions in Western art where Mary and John are twisted into an agony of sorrow because they seem to be sort of holding their emotions back those emotions seem all the stronger and the figure of the crucified Christ is extraordinary that bent body and the blood pouring from hands and feet I think this image of St Peter St Peter the rock on which Christ built his church his robes have been formed into this extraordinary crystalline geometrical pattern He's a human monument. It's an extraordinary, beautiful figure. But for me, the whole spirit of this place is summed up by this great Christ Pantocrator over the door. And unlike a lot of other Christs, who very much give you the feeling that Big Brother is watching you, this figure seems very benign. And with brilliant ingenuity, the artist has shaped Christ's body over the door, as if to suggest that his body would continue down and be the door, so that you enter, you enter this sacred space through Christ's body as you find your salvation through his worship. I think it's just a, a beautiful idea. One enduring enigma of Byzantine art is its apparent lack of spatial depth. It's hard to believe that the artists who created such powerful and complex imagery didn't know exactly what they were doing. But there was something about their use of space that I was finding it hard to put my finger on. To get a better understanding of the subtleties of Byzantine artistic technique, I thought it might be helpful to talk to a modern-day, living and breathing painter of icons. There are over 2,000 iconographers, as they're called, in Greece, many living and working in the monasteries, but by far the majority are here in Athens, and over 80% of their work is for the Greek Orthodox Church.
Georgios Cordes is one of the biggest names in icon painting. He's been working with these images for 20 years and recently accepted the commission to paint an entire Orthodox church in Beirut with frescoes. Is it important, I mean, I assume it's important that you, you are a believer, that you are a, a, a Christian to make, yes. to make this work? Yes, I think that it's important. <laughs> pretty pretty yeah. basic requirement. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, okay, otherwise it's, it's going to be very, very difficult to, you know, to paint things that you don't believe in. Are there days in your life where you as it were, just feel like you just don't have the right spiritual energy to make an icon so you don't paint? Uh, yes, sometimes. I, I can't paint, so I don't do it. I told Georgios that on my journey so far I'd met people who'd described the images portrayed in Byzantine art as having a mystical sense of reality. Both Chetty in Ravenna and Father Manzuranis in Hosias Lucas referred to the icons as being alive. An icon uh, is living when it has rhythm and when it communicates with the spectator through rhythm because this is the most important thing. So, Jorgos, you use the word rhythm a lot. Yeah. Is it possible for you to ex explain it to me? I I'm not sure I quite understand what you mean by it. Uh, yeah. Probably it's better to draw you something, you know, in order to show you what, what exactly I mean. This is the Byzantine uh, perspective. If we want to um, draw a house, um, we have to draw it in this way. You see? Mm -hmm. The back side goes up and the front side down. And the same thing happens here. See? Back, it's going up, and the other goes, that goes down. So, this figure comes to us. It moves towards here, and the perspective brings this figure to us. So we have two dynamics, two different dynamics. And in this way, we uh, create rhythm. You see? Rhythm so, so is the balance between the, these two dynamics. So, in a sense, the image is drawing out a cone exactly. into exactly. the world. Exactly. And, and I, come, I almost yes. enter the yes. space, or the space of the image yes. comes yes. out. Yes, the pictorial space is in front of the icon. And the spectator enters the, spe the pictorial space. And the spectator becomes part of the icon. Now, that's massively different from, from the Italian Renaissance. It's the opposite type of pictorial it's, space. It's the opposite, exactly the opposite. So in the Renaissance, the painting is a window. Yes. And I want to go through there. Yes, yes. Whereas the Byzantine... Mm -hmm. and, and what, so to speak, what is the... What's the point? Why? What's the point? Why? Why? Yeah, that's a good question. Why? Because in Byzantine tradition, um, which is very influenced by Orthodox theology, Knowledge is participation. If you want to know God, you have to participate in God. So, um, if we want to know this re iconic reality, we have to, to, to have a kind of participation in this reality. That's why when we um, paint the church, we have to create this kind of communion between the icons and the spectators. Listening to Georgios, I really did feel that the penny had finally dropped. It's not that this art doesn't have perspective, it's that it uses perspective in a different way. I'd responded to Byzantine art instinctively, but while I'd been walking around it and looking at it, I hadn't quite realised the extent to which it had been choreographing my movements, making me stand in a particular space 
within the cone shaped by its lines of force emerging from the images. I realized I had, literally as well as emotionally, been moved by this art. 98% of the people of Greece are Orthodox Christians. They take their religion and the art that's central to their faith very seriously. Most families create dedicated shrines full of images that can encompass photographs, postcards, even outright kitsch. Iconic art's part of the everyday lived experience here. For the Orthodox Church, icons are fundamental to the faith. Can you tell me a little bit about the importance of icons, paintings, mosaics, to the Orthodox Church? Well, one of the most important qualities of, of, of an icon is to help you pray, all right? And this has to do with the artistic style of the icon, uh, with the fact that the icon is a representation of the kingdom of God. Uh, I mean, to give an example, a Byzantine icon is filled with light. There is no single source of light. There is no shadow. It's the light of the grace of God. And all this affects the soul of the viewer. And um, it gives him something of the peace, the joy, the serenity, the calmness that is characteristic of Christian life and of the kingdom. The icon is not um, venerated in and for itself. The icon also always points towards a certain person and the person is venerated through the icon. Icons support prayer and of course people have some needs and they pray for them and uh, they somehow relate with the saint through the icon. Within the Greek Orthodox faith, icons cement the connection between saints and the people. It's a process that begins very early in life. When we baptize a child, we give him or her the name of a saint, partly in order to establish a relationship between this child and the saint, so the saint may act as a kind of role model to inspire the baptized person to follow in his steps as the saint followed in the steps of Jesus Christ. And yes, usually Christians feel that they have a certain connection with the saint whose name they bear, as well as with many other saints. Greece still remains a Christian country and people feel very much um, attached to, to the saints. I mean, the saints for them are not figures of the past, they are living realities. When Orthodox Christians uh, go in um, Western churches, uh, what they say is that they find them very cold, whereas they find our own churches spiritually warm with all the icons around, all this decoration, all this representation of the kingdom, the visual representation of the kingdom of God, it gives us strength to keep going. The special significance of the icon within the Greek tradition can be traced back to the very origins of the Orthodox Church. It was effectively created in 1054 when the Pope in Rome sent three cardinals to Constantinople where they delivered a document severing all links between the Byzantine East and the Church of Rome. This became known as the Great Schism. In truth, East and West had been becoming strangers to one another for a long period of time. 
A key issue was the role of the Pope, whose universal supremacy the Byzantines refused to acknowledge. 150 years after the Great Schism, the two forces would clash head on. In April 1204, crusaders en route to the Holy Land diverted to Constantinople. After a three-day rampage, they took control of the city. For the first time, the Byzantines had yielded to invasion. It was an event of such magnitude that it's been drawn and painted by artists down the centuries. A contemporary account describes the blood-curdling events. In the streets, in the temples, weeping, lamentations, the groaning of men, the shrieks of women, wounds, rape, captivity. The sacred altar, formed of all kinds of precious materials and admired by the whole world, was broken into bits and distributed among the soldiers. With Constantinople now in the hands of the West, the Byzantine Empire was doomed to a slow, lingering process of disintegration and decline. But the people of the city were determined to regain control of their beloved capital and restore some of the empire's earlier greatness. In 1261, after more than half a century of occupation by Western Christian forces, the city was once more restored as the Byzantine capital. It was an event that would herald the beginning of a last great artistic resurgence, and its centre was once more the Hagia Sophia. To mark the retaking of the city and the reclaiming of the cathedral, a great series of mosaics was commissioned from the empire's leading craftsmen. And if you want to have a sense of just how sophisticated, beautiful, subtle mosaic art could be in Constantinople in the second half of the 13th century, there's no better place to be than here. This mosaic is called the Deasis. It's one of the true masterpieces of Byzantine art. It shows the figures of the Virgin Mary and St. John the Baptist pleading with Christ for the salvation of man. It's typical of the final flowering of Byzantine art that followed the restoration of the empire in 1261. It's hard to believe that this degree of subtlety of modeling can be achieved in mosaic. These faces look forward towards the pinnacle of Renaissance art which was indeed hugely influenced by this earlier Byzantine Renaissance. Although the composition of the image and the poses of the figures are reflections of medieval Byzantine tradition, its psychological and emotional realism is quite new. With hindsight, it's easy to see all kinds of things in art that simply aren't there, but I wonder if there isn't some portent of the end of empire, the end that was to come, in the sad and solemn eyes of these figures. And they're just a fraction of what was once here. In looking at the modern fabric of the building, just occasionally you come across these little windows, so to speak, that have been cut into its mosaic past, revealing these beautiful fragments. It leaves you with a strange sense of not just how much has been lost, but how much might still lie beneath. By far the most complete example of late Byzantine art can be seen in one of the last buildings of the Byzantine Empire, the Kora Monastery. It once stood on the very outskirts of Constantinople, but today it's been swallowed up by modern Istanbul. The church of the Cora is one of the real jewels of Constantinople because it represents almost the only surviving example of the late style of Byzantine art in the city. This extraordinary mosaic cycle was created in the second decade of the 14th century and it shows scenes from the life of the Virgin and the life of Jesus. 
Now, if you look at the style of these mosaics, they're a world away from the statuesque, solemn monumentality of earlier Byzantine art. Suddenly, there's this tremendous emphasis on action, emotion, far more figures in the scenes. Over there, we see the rarely depicted miracle of the woman with the issue of blood, and she flings herself at Christ's feet with this extraordinary sort of energy in her pose that we just haven't seen this before in Byzantine mosaics. Over there, there's a very strong emphasis here on on Christ and his miracles. He's healing a, a blind man, healing a dumb man, healing a leper. The emphasis is very strongly on salvation. And I wonder if this urgency, this emphasis on salvation isn't partly to be explained by this scene here because it introduces us to the man who paid for all this. His name was Theodore Metakites and here he is on his knees offering this splendidly remodeled church to Jesus Christ himself. Now Theodore Metakites was a man with a distinctly dodgy reputation. Some even referred to him as the emperor's evil genius And he was renowned for fleecing the poor to line the imperial coffers. And I wonder if paying for this splendidly remodeled church with its mosaics wasn't his way of putting some of that money back, of offering it to God in the hope of saving his own soul. But the Cora's masterpiece is in the inner sanctum of the church. This space is Metakites' own funerary chapel, and he had it decorated, interestingly enough, in the much poorer medium of painting. Now, we don't know why that was so. Could it be that he deliberately chose it as an act of humility, or did he simply run out of money? Now, once again, we see scenes from the Bible, figures of saints, prophets, and angels, all in paint, but this time there's much less to detain the eye in these scenes. All the emphasis is towards this end, and towards this extraordinary image of the anastasis, the harrowing of hell. It's full of an energy that we've never really seen in Byzantine art before. Look at that central figure of Christ. Whereas before, drapery might seem almost like a form of abstract geometry, here you really feel that there's a body inside that drapery pulling its folds apart as Christ, with great physical urgency, pulls Adam and Eve, the forebears of all mankind, from their tombs. It's the resurrection. He's pulling them into eternity, pulling them into salvation. And salvation is what this space is all about because salvation is what Metakites dreamed of. What I really love in this, in this picture as well is this fantastic detail that Christ is harrowing hell and what what he's done is he's broken the gates of hell and you can see all this bric-a-brac, this debris, this lock smithery. Those are all the locks that were used to fasten hell but he's broken hell open and there we see almost, it's quite hard to make out, but there's the figure of Satan trampled beneath Christ's feet. It's a profoundly powerful, energetic image of salvation and I think it's not hard to imagine Metakites contemplating it very much with his own salvation in mind. Another thing that's interesting about this space and this story is that Metakites' life did not end up being entirely a bed of roses. In the 1320s, he was ousted from the imperial household during a palace coup. He lost all his money, all his power, all his privileges, and he ended up dying here as a monk, a simple monk, in the monastery church that he'd so richly endowed. And I don't think, perhaps, that by the time he did reach his end, he cared too much about the loss of all his power and privileges because his mind was not on the here and now. It was on eternity, on the image embodied in that extraordinary picture. Now, this is actually the last great work of Byzantine art in Constantinople. So it's not just one man's last memorial, last monument. It's also the swan song of an entire empire. The works of the Cora were indeed the final flourish of a dying civilization. The mighty capital of Constantinople finally fell to Turkish invaders in 1453. 
Christian art and architecture continued to exist under the new Ottoman Empire, but over the years the Christian artistic landscape gradually changed into an Islamic one. Cathedrals became mosques and minarets rose into the sky. Mosaics were plastered over or whitewashed. Works of art that had survived since the time of Emperor Constantine were gradually erased from the new Ottoman capital. And yet, the Byzantine art tradition might have been battered by centuries of turmoil, religious conflict, imperial decline, but it still survives in a multitude of powerfully direct images, forms and above all faces, so intensely eloquent they still seem on the point of speech. One last thought. Unlike virtually every other school of Christian art, the art that began in the Byzantine East, here in Constantinople, is still alive and thriving. Not bad for a supposedly primitive tradition. The Art of Eternity continues on BBC4 Wednesday evening at 9. Next, Fighting for Fidel.